So I would like to start today with something a little different than you may have done. So with pen in hand and a piece of paper on which to write, I want you to start with a little exercise for me that will help us get into the subject matter at hand. I'm stealing this from a, a book called Seven Habits. If you haven't read Seven Habits book, you should buy it, keep it, read it at least once a year. It's a most profoundly simple, easy to go by book on how to live your life and do business outside of the Bible that I've ever read. Seven Habits of Highly Successful People. Here's the picture. Imagine yourself pulling into the parking lot of a funeral home. And you look around and you seem to recognize some of these cars. You start to go in and you realize, gosh, there's a lot of people that you know. I wonder if this person who died is a very close friend of all of us. And you go in and it's a solemn occasion. But there are some people laughing, there are some people cutting up, there are some people embracing who hadn't seen each other in years. And you, you, your curiosity just peaked. So you go down to the casket and you look down in that casket and it's you. Ooh, so now you go sit on the front row and wonder, oh, wonder what they're going to say. So here's what I'd like you to do for me. You're on the front row. The first person who's going to speak will be one of your parents. Write down parents. The second person who's going to speak is a sibling. Leonard, that means a brother or a sister. I'm sure glad you came, Leonard. <laughs> the next person who gets up to speak is a professor from college. The next person is your boss. The next person, close friend. Now, next to each one of those, I would like you to write a brief statement on what you would really like to hear them say at your funeral. Not long, a brief statement about each one.
Really, there are just so many adjectives you can use. Um, let's try to wrap this up, and uh, you can finish this later if you haven't finished. Uh, after these two-day sessions, I'm, I'm assuming with all your interface and interaction and whatever that you kind of gotten over your real hesitancy to speak up as if you had any when you came. Uh, uh, I found that students who are willing to take time out to come do this and enjoy this, participate in this, are pretty serious people who like to have a good time. Uh, somehow that combination goes. So here's what I'd like to do. I'd like you to volunteer on the first one. Would anybody like to volunteer on what you said on the first one? Parent. Yes, Noel. That's cool. Okay, somebody next. Anybody on the next one? Sibling? Yes, sir. Best friend. Okay, what's the next one? Professor, I believe. Yes, sir. That's pretty simple. That's pretty straightforward. Okay, now we're getting to uh, what, boss? Yes. Um, work harder, stay longer, ask the questions, but also live with how to get as you never get to me. Mm. Pretty nice. Okay. Uh, what about friend? Are we to friend yet? Yes. Um, I put loyal, uh, loving, a good listener, and a friend that would always would love to the fullest and do everything with you. Okay, there's one other I didn't ask you to do, and this is one I want you to think about some more and not do right now. This is the person for whom you have the least respect or admiration that you interface with. And then what would they say? See, part of this exercise is that hopefully when you get home and take this, I hope you'll take it. I hope Because you see, it's important, it's not what you covered here, it's called the residue. The residue. And that is, what do you take out of here and use? What's something that's going to change your thinking and your behavior? positively that you gained here. One is you gained some new friends. My guess is some of you will keep up with each other even though you're the other end of the planet. Maybe. Maybe a week or two. But the residue from here is what do you care from here? And part of what you care from here is what you have just said, how does that compare to what would be said today? And you have the greatest opportunity in the world as young people to predetermine your own funeral. You really do. Uh, how many of you are familiar with the CIA? The Culinary Institute of America. Well, what were you thinking? Yeah, you were thinking about that. You could be thinking about Curry Ingram Academy in Nashville, Tennessee. It's one of the greatest schools, academies for special learning needs kids. There are a lot of other CIAs. There's even but the most important CIA I know is made on three words. Control, influence, and accept. You cannot control another person. To the degree you try to control another person, you lose influence with and for that person. Do you like to be controlled? No. My daughter turned 13 and her control button went off. Or as my grandson, Ford, 12, tells his sister, uh, who really, uh, Lily, is nine, and she's in charge of all the grandchildren, you're not the boss of me. Okay? Nobody likes to be controlled. The toughest control issue you'll have in your life is you. Hoo-hoo. Now we're, we're talking. This is hard. To be under control. The power you have is to influence. And that's what you have a great opportunity to do in your future and your life is to influence, positive influence behavior of other people. So that they'll, they'll be glad you're in their environment. You're an encourager. You speak the truth. But there are four words that I have found that people really like to hear said about them at funerals. One is love, 
One is respect, one is admire, and one is trust. Because I will tell you, the important thing in the funeral will not be reading off whether I served on the Kemp Commission on Tax Reform. Who really gives a rip? It's going to be talking about my relationships and my interface with other people. It won't be about my success, it will be about my significance. Success is what I am able to build for myself through the appreciation of other people. But significance is what I've been able to do to help somebody else achieve great things. Significance is helping build a Habitat for Humanity house. Significance is failing the test because you weren't as prepared as you should have been and you decided I'm not going to give up who I am for a done test which may determine whether I keep scholarship. It may determine whether my transcript allows me to go to graduate school. And at your age, all of a sudden the whole world may be hinging on, it won't hurt me, everybody is cheating a little bit. Cheating is kind of like pregnancy. You either are a cheater or you aren't. You know, there's no kind of conditional thing here. <laughs> so, you know, somebody said I told a little white lie. Wrong. You either told the truth or you didn't. Now, what I have observed in Washington, D.C. through the years is people don't, don't lie nearly as much as they deceive. You can tell part of the truth. When I was in high school, there was a woman who was smart enough to have a little cafe bar and named it his mama's place. So I would say, where are you going? He said, I'm going over his mama's place. I told the truth, didn't I? I was going to his mama's place. <laughs> but and what she thought. <laughs> so sometimes we'll ethically break down over trying to get someone to believe something that's just not quite exactly true. For instance, you are uh, got a roommate phone call comes and it's that Schmidt guy again trying to ask you out and you just say I'm not here so you're asking your roommate to lie is that, is that an accurate statement you don't want to talk to this person no 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 tell them I'm not available right now to tell the truth yeah is that deceptive no you're not available why you ain't walking five feet over to get the phone I'm just not available. So I think when we get down to the nitty gritty, everything you've ever needed to know about living you learned in kindergarten. The basic ethics of how you live and who you are and how you're known. You see, ethics is a standard of values. That's what ethics is. Ethical behavior is living out what you profess to believe. You've got to believe something first. Predetermining Ethical decisions will give you the freedom to not have to worry about unintended consequences. The biggest problem with the federal government, and I'm sure this is true in other places, when the House Ways and Means Committee, that's a committee that uses every means they can to get, every way they can to get rid of your means. It's a house. Would you do a little? Okay. Um, they pass laws and bills that have unintended consequences. 1986 Tax Act, everybody thought was great because we're doing away with this, we're going to fix this and fix that. It destroyed two industries within four years. Unintended consequences. Did they mean to destroy the savings and loan industry? No. Did they? Yes, with one bill. The unintended consequences. One of the saddest stories for me was a young man that I was very close to for a number of years. But he had this real problem of wanting to be accepted by a certain clique that he was not a part of. These were the cool. Now our son in high school was a cool geek. In fact, they called themselves the cool geeks. They were very smart and very good at technology. Uh, and they had the size and ability, but just didn't really want to go out and butt heads with people. 
He never aspired to be appreciated by them, but there were some that wanted to be accepted by them because they were the stars. So what happens? Oh, come on, what's one more drink? Jeez. Well, you candy, where did you come from? I'm going to drive. Yeah, but you can't even walk straight. If you've already predetermined a decision based on your values, that number one, you're not going to get in a car to go with anybody if somebody's driving it and they've been drinking. I don't care if they've had a beer. You just don't need to. You've already predetermined. So it's not personal. It's not that I don't trust you. I have already decided over here. Mama told me. Well, everybody's doing it. That guy just jumped off a cliff. Well, let me get over there. So ethical first starts with value system. What is it that I really believe? What kind of person do I really want to believe that frees me from having to make situational ethical decisions? I used to travel a lot, about 100,000 miles a year. Uh, NFIB has offices in all 50 states. We've got uh, about 400,000 businesses and members, 1,000 employees, and it, it, the CEO is a pretty busy guy. Plus, he got all these state governors that think they want to talk with you, and so it, it, you're traveling all the time. So, part of the little book I'm writing on lessons learned, one chapter is shower heads I've known. If you travel very much, you'll find it, it's hard to get to shower heads. Little side note, a guy named Bill Marriott, the Marriott Corporation is his. Bill Marriott uh, was chairman of the Export Council with the President. I had to serve on that council. We went to China together. I spent a good bit of time with Bill. And I was joking with him about shower heads I've known. He said, if it's a Marriott owned, managed property, all the shower heads are the same. All the beds will be the same. The mattresses and boxes will be the same within 18 months. Okay, you're at a Marriott property. No, you're not. This resort is owned by the Alabama Teachers Retirement Fund. It is managed by a professional hotel management company that's not Marriott. They're a franchise. Marriott comes in and does audits to make sure they stay up to the standards. So the shower heads here may be different. Because you go, you go to a Marriott-owned property, especially JWs. You go to JWs, Marriott property, and I'm guaranteed they'll be the exact same. Why? He said the two biggest complaints travelers who are road warriors tell you is you never can trust a shower head. Women especially don't like it because I did not intend to shampoo. The consistency says. I can safely go to the Marriott property because I know because it's going to be consistent. The toughest business to ever get in, I want to tell you right now, is the restaurant business. It's the hardest business in the world. You're dealing with perishable product. You're dealing with people who are on the lowest end of the scale. You're waiting for somebody to come in and they're going to gripe, moan, and complain if it isn't perfect. It's a tough business. But people who are really good at it, they really do a good job. If you're ever back around this area sometime, you go to a little place called Magnolia Springs. It's about 20 minutes from here. A little place called Jesse's. It's an old house. Whew. They know how to do it. Now let me tell you the problem about Jesse's. If Jesse ever decides to have Jesse's too, they got a real problem. Because now they can't keep consistently, consistency with a quality product service. And that's the hardest thing to do. You have an opportunity to control yourself to the point that you're consistent and people can trust you because they know you're going to do the right thing. If they don't want to invite you to their party, that's not a big deal. Why? Because you've already made that decision. You never have to worry about being in a car with another person late at night trying to make a decision about your activities. If you've already made that decision, you with me? You have a chance to make some decisions right now. Some of you may have already made a lot of them. You make some decisions right now, it's going to carry the rest of your life. It's going to impact when you may be on the front row listening to what they've got to say. If that's important to you. What about GMC? Well, GMC, uh, well, I'm, what, trucks? Carry heavy load? 
Pretty good. But the GMC I talk about and worry about sometimes is gripe, moan, and complain. I'm going to tell you the biggest problem we have as a people. We gripe, moan, and complain, and that is not a problem-solving situation. Gripe, moan, and complain is I'm all focused about the problem, not the adventure. Now, you can be Pollyannish, and you can be naive and say, oh, that's not a problem, that's an adventure. I had to be on the, it, part of my past is I was with a friend of mine who, who happened to own an international construction firm, and uh, I'm on a plane from Atlanta to Nashville with the president of Holiday Inns and the, the president of the Hospital Corporation of America, uh, Dr. Tom Frist. Bless his heart, he'd been deceased a number of years. We're on our way back, and we've been down there to look at a huge Holiday Inn hotel that they want to convert to a hospital. And he was telling Dr. Tom, you know, there's just not that much difference between a hotel and a hospital. We just add surgery rooms. Really? There's not that big a difference. Dr. Tom said, well, it seems that your hotel even has an awful lot of problems. He said, Dr. Tom, you're not a business guy, so you don't understand. It's not a problem. It's just a mere opportunity. Dr. Tom said, oh, well, I'm going to tell you, your hotel has way too many opportunities for us. <laughs> true story. That's the, the tradition that Dr. Tom had, and when he had his funeral, I'll guarantee you of the things said. One of the things that I'm, I'm, I'm kind of jealous of, in a way, because I, I'm my father's son, but I'm not. I'm more like my mother. I'm sorry, George W. has the same problem, but... My father's funeral, everybody that came from, known him from throughout his lifetime and different things he'd done, all said this very same thing about him in his funeral. He's the sweetest man I ever met. If I die today and you happen to show up at the funeral, ain't nobody going to say that about me. I wish you could, but I'm not a sweet guy. My, I got a, one child that thinks I, the other one doesn't, but one child thinks I'm a pretty sweet guy, but I've been, work, I've been working on her a long time. Uh, so, so ethical behavior starts with an ethical-based decision you have made about who you are and what you're going to be. So what causes people to break down on ethical behavior? Here's the first one. Fear of failure. That is a huge motivator. Fear of failure. Let me tell you, there are a lot of successful people in politics and in business and other things, including uh, pastors of churches that are driven by fear of failure, still. Trying to prove to dad that I'm going to be successful even though dad may be dead. There's a huge fear of failure out there. And because of that, it'll cause us to shift and move. Instead of being on solid rock, we'll be on shifting sands, and that doesn't work really well. Another one is acceptance. One of the things I learned from my father is that, son, don't spend a lot of time and money trying to impress people you either don't know or don't like. If you have a good friend, is it, is it a big rip deal what you wear when you're with that big dear friend? Do they really care? No. Why do we want to make sure that we are Looking cool. Acceptance is a primary thing. Now, there's some people I've observed that want to be accepted, but they want to be accepted by just their group. So they're very peculiar because they all dress alike, but they don't dress like anybody in the room. You don't know anybody like that. You know, a lot more underwear showing than Levi's. So, what's the next one? You got fear of failure. You got acceptance. The third one is called disappointment. Ooh, see, disappointment is really hard. Especially if you grew up in a family like mine that said, son, if you play basketball, you'll be probably the point guard. If you play baseball, you'll be the star pitcher. If you play football, you'll be the leading quarterback. Because, son, you're a leader. You're always top. You're an A student. And they meant to be very supportive. And I'm going, Really? I'm not the best quarterback. So if I play tackle to that degree, I'm a failure. 
You hear me now? This is true confession. My father thought a real man was a big guy with a bass voice. I don't have a bass, bass voice. I mean, I don't. Well, there are pictures that have been painted of you by parents, by friends, by associates, maybe even by grandparents, that have painted a picture for you that you're trying to live up to and you don't want to disappoint them. God bless you for not wanting to disappoint people. As our daughter once told me, Dad, I can understand your anger, but your disappointment just really wears me out. I can't handle it when you're disappointed. Don't let disappointment drive you to break a value base that you've already predetermined. Predetermined value base says, I don't have to make situation ethical decisions. So when somebody brings me a, an opportunity to go do something, be somebody, smoke it, drink it, shoot it, whatever I'm going to have an opportunity to do, I don't have to make any decision about that. Why? I've already made that decision. That's the bad stuff kind. I need to put in the good stuff. I don't want the bad stuff. I've already predetermined. Now, does that make me uh, outcast? Could be. God bless you. Nothing like being an outcast that has solid ethics. Let me tell you why. That will follow you the rest of your life. I will tell you a game you need to play. And when you play this game with other people, you learn more about their ethics than anything else. The game is golf. You know why they call it golf? The other four-letter words were used. <laughs> so they just call it golf. Uh, did any of you watch Rory do his fabulous thing at the golf tournament? I mean, this is a 22-year-old kid. 21, he blows it in the Masters and loses. Said I learned, I got some character. He comes back, he's just incredible. Good, okay. So uh, I'm an old debater, so I like to use current stuff. This is the newspaper this week. This is talking about uh, a letter to the editor about this guy. And he talks about how cool it was for, uh, here it was for one of the top golfers of all time, Mickelson, seeing Rory get an eagle, stop and stand off to the side and applaud him. Okay, the star is applauding the 22-year-old. Here's what this guy says, Timothy Morgan from Port Angeles, Washington. That's why I tell mothers and fathers of young children, if you want to teach your children to be honest, upright, good sports, teach them the game of golf. The basic rules of the game from the structure for living a decent life. You keep your own score. You play the ball as it falls. You call infractions on yourself. Have you ever watched golf very much? I've watched people lose a golf tournament causing a penalty on themselves that nobody else saw. Went to putt and the ball moved. Nobody saw it but the guy. Tossed him a stroke. He didn't make the playoff. One stroke short. That guy's one of the most respected people out on the golf course. Would you rather win the tournament or be one of the most respected people? Think about that one. I'm going to tell you, through the years, I've had opportunity to win things, be awarded things, I get plaques and all that kind of stuff. And none of them hugged me back. And you know where they are now? I don't know. They're in the basement somewhere. We don't put this stuff around our house. I got more pictures of politicians, some alive, some dead, than you can shake the bird stick at. What am I going to do with all this? Well, I can't throw it away. Well, I said, why not? Who cares? You had dark hair at the time. Nobody knows. Okay, you ready for this? In golf, unlike other sports, you're playing against the golf course as well as the other golfers. I applaud Mickelson's classy response. Uh, I won't name the president, but we had a president a few ago that loved to play golf, which a lot of them do, including our current president. Uh, and he had the amateur champ play with him at the Army-Navy Club. And when they got through playing, they asked the Army-Navy, I mean the, the uh, amateur, how was it like playing with the president? He said, different. He said, really? He said, yeah. He said, it's the only man I've ever played with that hits a Titleist in the woods and hits a Bridgestone out. He said, well, he played a good game. He shot a 78. The guy said, a 78? He said, well, yeah, that's what his scorecard. The guy said, okay.
Ethical behavior that's accurate and good is doing the right thing when nobody's looking. That simple. It is that simple. If you come out of a building and there's a parking lot and you look and there's a wallet this thick and there's cash sticking out of it and there's nobody around. How many of you would pick it up and try to identify the owner and get it back to them? Everybody raises their hand. Okay, good. I'm not sure, but I heard what you said. You see, situation ethics says you're going to have to make some decisions based on new information. Where if you already made the decision that this is the correct and right thing to do, you don't have to look around and see if anybody's there. You with me on this one? Okay, I got another one. You come out of the same building, same parking lot, and now there's a piece of metal over there with spikes sticking out of it in the driveway. Do you think you need to be the one to go over and move that out of the way? I don't work here. It's not my job. I don't do repair work. Anybody stupid enough to run over that ought to get the tire. So you don't move it. Maybe you do. I'm going to give you another fact. A pregnant woman, eight months, with two small children, comes out of that same building. She is rushing to the hospital. She gets in her minivan and she runs across this. It flattens her tire. Her water breaks as she goes right to the edge of the highway. Now, if you knew that beforehand, would you have moved that piece of metal with the spikes in it? I hope you would. So what do you got to assume, people? The right thing is to see danger and remove it. It's not your job. That's one of the biggest problems in business today is somebody saying, no me abi. No me abi. It's not my job. The biggest problem with unions in America is it's not my job. The biggest problem is with work ethic. It's not my job. Let me tell you, ethical behavior says I'm going to do the right thing whether I receive benefit for it or not because it's just the right thing to do. And I'll take whatever consequences come later. This is hard to do, people. Your influence is tremendous right now. You will go back to your college with more influence than you had before because you came here. You've been exposed to some stuff in the last two days that the folks back at your college had not been exposed to. You have an opportunity because you have knowledge, you have experience, that you can go back and be a difference than you even were before in a very positive way. Acceptance is the third letter of CIA. There's some things you just have to accept. I had a, I had a chief operating officer who was really good. He's about 5'5 five five with heels. He said, everybody in my life has told me I'm supposed to be six feet tall. And then I realized God doesn't make any mistakes. If he wanted me six feet tall, he'd have made, he made me 5'5. Five five, and so I must be 5'5 five five all alive, man. I don't need to be six feet. I know some guys I've worked with have short complex, and I'm telling you, they fight that the rest of their life. Got a chip on their shoulder. Then I know some guys 6'2 that think because God made them 6'2, they're kind of superior. And got anything to do with it. how tall you are is inside, not outside. how tall you are. A friend of mine said, you know, beauty is only skin deep, but ugly goes all the way to the bone. I'm not recommending that. But I would tell you, when somebody tells me, you ought to take her out, she's got a great personality. What did you just learn? Are you with me on guys? Great personality, right? We make too many judgments by first impression, which is the only time you make a first one. But as you get to know somebody, you really get a chance to see them when something happens that's not good or right. I used to, I'm a recovering banker. I mean, I'll never get over it. I spent my first 10 years in the banking business. I never knew how good a loan customer I had until they couldn't make the interest payment, much less the loan. The real good customer would call me ahead of time and say, Jack, I can't make the payment. I'm running behind. Business is not good. I want to come in and talk to you about it. But I don't even have the interest to renew this note. I need you to renew it and add the interest to it. Can I come talk to you about it? Absolutely. See, I'm a sucker for that guy. I'm, I already knew before he came in, I'm going to extend him the interest and increase that loan. But the guy I got a call for a week, two, three weeks, finally send a letter to that doesn't show up. I don't care what his financial statement looks like. 
I just soon eat bank somewhere else. Because you're not going to really know who you are till you come up a place where you are losing or going to look bad or not be approved or be fearing a failure. Then you're going to find out who you are. A guy named Dr. Ross Peeble, Birmingham, Alabama. I heard him once say 100 years ago, well, it was maybe 30 years ago. The events of your life, the circumstances, people, places, things, and events do not make you what you are. They only reveal who you are. I can't make you angry, but I can reveal, if I get to know you, I can reveal the anger you have within you. You with me on this? And if you say, I'm not an angry person, I didn't say you're an angry person, but if you have any anger in you, if I get to know you well enough, I can push button B. It'll come out. In politics, you learn that you control who you vote for, you control who you write a check for, you control who you want to try to, to get on your bandwagon with this person. You can influence others to vote, influence others to give money, influence others to use their influence. But when the election day comes, you have to accept the results. By ballot, not bullet, you have to accept the results. Then the key is, okay, those results, okay, now what do I do now? Or you can sit in the corner and moan, gripe, complain, or gripe, moan, complain. Or you can say, okay, lost that one. What am I going to do next? The most successful people in politics I've ever met always lost before because failure is a laboratory for future success. You don't learn when you win. You learn when you lose. Now, should that mean you want to go out and, let me go out and lose? <laughs> Trust me, that'll happen. So the best thing about relationships I ever learned was losing a sweetheart once. Whew. I've had 38 great years of marriage. 38 out of 47 is really good. Uh, it's, but it's been the last 38. Okay, thank you very much. I, it's, been the la it's been the last 38. But the lessons in politics. I talked to Newt Gingrich when he was speaker. Uh, Newt ran for the House three times in Georgia in a Democrat district and didn't get elected. He's just so stubborn and so egotistical. He thought, I'm going to keep on running. They'll eventually get it. And so he got elected. Uh, 1976, I campaigned with a guy named Ronald Reagan, the governor of California, running against the incumbent Gerald Ford, one of the nicest guys I've ever worked with, built timely. Gerald Ford's a great guy. And Ronald Reagan lost that, and he learned. And he came back and won. I'm going to tell you the chief loser in politics. Now, I want you to know, I have Arctic blonde hair, but I never met this guy. Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> You're talking about a loser? Go read about this guy. And then with 32% of the vote, he got elected president of the United States. Did you know that? 32% of the vote. Two years into his presidency, they didn't po do polls then, but they'd ask a lot of questions, and all he knew is if anybody ran against him, they'd win. I just finished a book about Lincoln as the, the commander-in-chief, about what he did to manage the military. And a very, very interesting slant. If you want to read a good book and learn, read Lincoln on Leadership. If you want to understand better how our country got together, put Founding Fathers on Leadership. Both of these books written by a guy named Donald Phillips. My dear departed friend, Charlie Tremendous Jones, great public speaker, built two insurance companies, wonderful man. He said the only difference today between you today and five years from now, two things. People you meet in the books you read, the people you meet in the books you read, the people you meet in the books you read. I want to encourage you, even now as students, when you've got books, uh, or maybe your book is on a screen. People you meet in the books you read. Leadership is developed more out of failure than out of winning. Because now you can relate. Now you can understand. Now you examine. So don't be afraid of it when it comes and don't live with it. It's a laboratory. You examine it and you move on. Is this making sense? I want, is this applicable to anything you're dealing with? I want to tell you it has to do with good friends of yours. It has to do with colleges... Uh, administration, uh, different professors you deal with. It deals with everybody that you touch. If you are successful controlling yourself based on principles and guidelines, you predetermine, pre pre-establish that are ethical behaviors. You already predetermined that. One, two. You're willing to use 
as much control over yourself to live by those as possible. Third is maximize your positive influence. Then what you have to accept is smiling on the front row at the funeral. You're not thinking about a funeral the long way away. I wasn't either. I was 18. I was playing baseball. I was good enough to play. Not enough for anybody to pay me to play. Uh, we had a 16-year-old kid that was one of the best plays we had, a shortstop. I mean, he moved to the ball before the bat was swung. I mean, this guy could smell it until he had a cerebral hemorrhage and died playing baseball. 16. It's like my friend whose grandson, two weeks ago, coming home from a party, didn't get to the house before he hit a tree and gone. I'm not trying to be discouraging or maudlin. I just know a, a rule to give you to live by. Nothing good happens after midnight. Well, I'm telling you now, nothing good happens after midnight. You read about these ball players that get in trouble? 2.30 in the morning, 4 o'clock in the morning. Nothing good happens after midnight, folks. And you say, well, the party just starts. It well, yeah. And I've learned that the more you drink, the less you're thinking about ethical behavior. Because alcohol puts you in a now only. You don't think about long-term and unintended consequences. So I'm not trying to say you ought to be a teetotaler. But I'm just saying don't lose control of yourself for any reason, for anything. That includes anger. No good decision is made when you're emotionally disturbed, emotionally problem. Emotion includes love, infatuation. Still, don't make a great decision on that one. Best decisions are made on logic. Because then you can go back to the core of who you are and really what you believe. Now, you may go to church Sunday and get a sermon, but I'm going to guarantee you had one this morning. Golf. Uh, I used to call it a game until I realized I wasn't getting better. You know, it's now, I call it an outing. Then I go out and enjoy the weather, enjoy good friends, and once in a while I really hit a good ball. And a lot of guys keep score and charge a dollar and Nassau and all this, and who, come on, get the putt! And I'm standing over three foot putt, and I'm thinking, I've been competitively problem faced all my life. Why do I want to take time at 69 years old to stand over a little white ball and get upset over three foot putt over a dollar? Or two? I like John Boehner's approach to play golf with the President of the United States. Did you hear what he wanted to have the odds to be? By the way, I played golf with John Boehner. John is a very good player. Now, the person he chose to play with him, John Kasich, governor of Ohio, I, when he was back in the house, I used to play with these Ohio guys. There's three of them played golf in Ohio, the Congress. Highly competitive with each other. Two of them are pretty good, and Kasich wasn't. So Kasich's the drain Saturday. I don't remember what happened. But Boehner said, why don't we pay for a trillion dollars a point on the deficit? Um, a couple of things I wanted to leave with you. I heard in 1975 a guy named Doug Coe out of Washington, D.C. They had to put on it called the Fellowship. They put on things like the National Prayer Breakfast. Uh, Chuck Colson is out of that group. I mean, it, it's just a, it's a behind the scenes group around the world trying to get people to do the right thing. Doug Coe spoke to a group at a men's retreat I went to in 75, and he said, God seems to be interested in two things, relationship and geography. Hmm, I got the relationship. I didn't get the geography. And he said, everything in the Bible that's important, he know exactly where it happened. On the sea of, a road of, the mount of, the, the garden of. See, geography is a huge deal. But I also read the Bible on three things that I keep hearing young people come to me with answers. They want answers about education, career, and retirement. So I started studying it. Education. Well, this is from a biblical perspective. Y'all kind of forgive me a little bit for being not politically correct here. But the Bible says, God says, know me and know enough about why you believe in me to tell somebody else. That's all he said about education. What about career? He didn't care if you were even a tax collector <laughs> or a fisherman or a tent maker. Provide for your family or you're worse than a fool. 
What do you say about retirement? The Kings died, went to sleep with their fathers. I'm not retired. I'm in my fourth quarter. And next year, I'll go into overtime. First overtime. So the key here is geography. Your physically being here makes a huge difference. You could never have had the interplay you've had, including this very creative story, Adrian, I got to hear. You, stay. you, you really ought to talk to the Disney people. You got, a, you got an opportunity there. Well, John, I would hope so. I would hope so. Um, geography is a huge deal. Being in the right place with the right people determines how easy or how hard it's going to be to you live up to the standards you have set for yourself. Not standards your parents set up. Not, pa not standards that your buddies in college have set up. Be careful about that one. The standard you have set up for yourself as adults that you are today. Your ethical behavior will have incredible impact for the future. NASBA as an organization. NASBA is an organization, they set standards to allow people to be ethical. That's what NASBA does. Why do we have the Center for Public Trust? A guy named David A. Costello decided that after all the Enrons and uh, Arthur Andersons and all this other stuff, mess was going on, it was time for us as a community to start focusing on doing the right thing. Center for the Public Trust. And let me tell you where it all starts. It starts with you. It starts with you, Callie. It really does. You can't control other people, but you can have influence if you can control yourself. And your first point of control is, am I going to have a set of ethical values that determines who I am in most every situation? Or you can let other people decide it for yourself, for you. I went through a period of time in my life I won't get into, but I did some of the craziest things that I would, some of which I never even told my wife, that, that, uh, that it's a wonder I'm not dead, incarcerated, shot by somebody's husband. I mean, there's just no telling uh, because of very poor choices I made. Let me tell you one of the reasons I made these poor choices is I wanted to be cool. <laughs> Oh, uh, my. And I found out you can be cool and be frozen right up on a slab. But the standard you have to set is for yourself. So I encourage you, even as you leave here, to do two basic things. One is, I'd like to, you to write yourself a letter or email or memo that says, here's what I have gained and gathered from my time here that is applicable for me in my future. Go back over the, the content that you covered, the notes you took. I mean, when Linda talked to you yesterday morning, you should have a lot of notes. There's other things you've done, you've learned. Okay, now what are you going to do with it? How are you going to apply it? Here's what I'm asking you to consider on the second thing for my little segment today. With all due respect to college, be really serious about this one. Because it's the foundation on which your future is determined. It has to do with your future. One of the things I was going to do today, I was going to break you up in groups of seven each, different than this. I was going to give you some case studies, which are in your book. I was going to ask you to study those and come back and give a report. The more I thought about this this morning, the more I thought, this is the only shot I get at you people. I'll probably never see any of you again. And so I, I owe it to myself is to give you my best shot on what I've tried to learn in 69 years of failure and success. And that'll knock you right down there too. <laughs> take seriously what you're about and don't take yourself too seriously. You take a lot of pressure off. So you heard the grandfather talk this morning. And my hope that maybe some, some of the things we discussed and talked about may be of some value and use to you. I would suggest to you, if you go back, you got a roommate or your family, 
and talk to them and ask them about what ethical standards have they set up. And they may look at you really strange at first, like, say, well, where did you go and what did you learn? Because you're at an age right now, more than any age you'll have in the future, that you have the freedom to establish some norms for yourself that will be very difficult to do later on. I'm not saying you can't do it later on, but it's very difficult to do later on. I want you to look at these case studies. There are four case studies in there. One of them has to do with the whole thing of sexting. And, uh, and I'm not talking about a wiener roast here. I'm just talking about <laughs> sexting. Um, and the only thing I can think about it, one of two things, either you have a different kind of abnormality about what's cool, uh, or you really need to get some counseling to, to do that. I want you to look through that. I want you to think about that. How does it apply to me and what I'm doing? Yes, dear. Until 12 o'clock. What? You can have until 12 o'clock. Oh, no. No, I can't either because i got to check out. Thank you, though. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, you, have a, you, have a, you have four different kinds of situations that you look at. Okay? Turn to those, if you would. Now look at the first one, to D or not to D. You know, if you fail a class and they put an F by it, that happens sometimes, doesn't it? But maybe you need to put a D by it that indicates that you cheated. Now, how would that look on your transcript? Today or not today? Read through that. The most important thing about this illustration for me is that when you cheat on anything at any time and get by with it, you have become a cheater. You're now allowing yourself to cheat on other things. Cheat on a friend, cheat on a spouse, cheat on a job. We used to hire people to go work in Saudi Arabia. We had to give them lie detector tests. We had to give them drug tests, all kinds of tests, because you go from working in a rural area in Tennessee and you go work in Saudi Arabia. Woo-hoo-hoo. Construction, the big difference. You know, we found out 100% of the people interviewed failed when you asked them, have you ever taken anything that wasn't yours? Because even the honest of honest people know that at one point in time they took two pens and three pencils or a notepad, because at some point in time in our life, we have inadvertently, or no big deal, taken something that wasn't ours. Second grade, I came home with a pack of five cent, paper cost five cents. They had two rings and three ring binders, uh, holes, okay? That's before they went to five. Some paper had two, some had three. All right, mine was a three. The little kid next to me had a new packet of paper, and it was a two. I mean, it was a three, and he had a two. He couldn't use it, so he threw it away. I said, throw it away, paper. Mama told me not to do that. So I reached down and said, three, I can use that. Put it in my folder and come home. Mother said, where'd you get the paper? I knew she'd never believe that story. 
that somebody would actually throw away a pack of paper. It cost a nickel. I said, I bought it. She said, you had a nickel and you bought paper instead of ice cream? I said, son, I'm having a really hard time with this. <laughs> and my father told me then, son, you're a smart kid. You're going to do well. But you're not smart enough to remember everything you've ever said. So if you just say the truth, you don't have to worry about what you have said. Once you take a step over a little bit, then the next step's easier. In the banking business, we had a, t a, a teller for the savings book, which happened years and years ago, it was called a book, pre-computer days. She'd been with the bank 18 years, most trusted little old lady you'd ever want to see in your life, found out she'd been stealing money for 15 years out of dormant accounts. A little bit of time, a little bit of time, a little bit of time, a little bit of time. So I learned through the years, the most trust, if you're missing money, go interview the tr most trusted person you got. You got to be really careful because the more they're trusted, the more you don't hold them accountable, which we didn't with her. We just let her handle it. The little bitty steps where you're stepping outside of who you are, where you're going to fail. And that's what this is about. This failure, if they put the D next to it, is going to be there the rest of your life. Is it worth it? What do you think? Is this a fair thing for a university to do, to put that on the transcript? Well, it must mean that you don't think you're ever going to be accused of that. So you have to be really steer clear because there are other people who would like you to cheat because it makes them feel better about them cheating. Copying a paper, plagiarizing, whatever it is. Okay. Look at the next one. Well, this one, I, this one is fun. Our son is vice president of technology of a uh, software computer company in healthcare. And uh, he gets most of his really good personal work done at Starbucks. And he's got his head set on and he's over in the corner. And I read this example and I thought, I can see how this would work. This roach baiting again. What's your take? on this story. I'm talking ethical behavior. Now what she's doing is clever, isn't it?
technique. Say that again. I was I was saying that um, it it's sort of deceiving, but I don't know if it's you know truly that unethical. I just I see it as another advertising technique, which advertising sometimes does get unethical and kind of plays dirty. But I think that's just a part of the advertising game. Okay. Anybody else? Somebody else have a comment about it? Whatever. Any comment? I mean, if you were offered this job, would you be comfortable doing this as a job? Leonard, are you going to take up a new career? <laughs> <laughs> See, I think that part of what I really like about this is what you're saying, and that is, well, is deception okay? Let me tell you what you got to really watch it. We're going to come up with this to the next one. And as I get these resumes from time to time, and they put universities, colleges. I had one other that got Harvard, Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. I thought, gee, this is impressive. And as I dug deeper, I found it. He went to a five day seminar. Because what you're saying is, this is not a lie. But is she saying the truth, telling the truth? And nobody called her. I mean, she's, she's doing something to get somebody to, to advertise. So we could say this is a form of advertising, which makes you stop and think, maybe about some of the advertising. David Costello, president of NASBA, is going through, you've heard him speak, he's going through uh, looking at what people, companies say is who they are. They have a name and then they have a slogan. And he's trying to find out where that come from, who came up with that, do, do you really believe that? How do you prove that? I saw a billboard down in Montgomery, Alabama on the interstate where the Hyundai plant is, huge facility. And they got a big billboard and it says, the only thing important at Hyundai is quality. Besides quality. So what did I remember? Quality. Why does Hyundai want to push quality so hard? Well, their first product from Korea was not quality. So they're trying to impress on you quality. If they say it long enough and often enough, you're going to think Hyundai is quality until they prove you different. One of my concerns about this story is this is, in my opinion, this is a slippery slope story. If, in fact, it's okay for me to deceive people about who I am and what I'm doing about this, what's wrong with deceiving about other things? You see, some of these things come up and they aren't just black and white. But you've got to stop and you say, how comfortable am I with that based on the values I've established for myself? Now, I'm not saying it's wrong for everybody. It may be not fine for somebody else, but for me, Let's look at the next one. things I've learned through the years interviewing people is beware of resume gaps. I first learned that when I found out the two-year thing and that was wrong was they were in prison. They didn't tell me. They just didn't put that in the resume. And that kind of made a difference, since especially it was a check kiting and they wanted to work at the bank. I mean, it's kind of an important piece. And here's a guy 
to say that does the end justify the means? I need to feed my family. I'm overqualified. Everybody tell me I'm overqualified. I can't get a job. Let me tell you, there are a lot of people on the street right now in this same situation. They were vice presidents. They are 48 years old, and they got a whole level of management cut out of the company. And now they've got a job. They want any kind of job. Say, well, you won't stay here very long. As soon as some good job comes up, you're leaving. You're overqualified, overeducated. Do you have a question or a point? I do that again. Um, <laughs> I, you want your own microphone? <laughs> no, sorry. No. Um, with this, he's making himself less qualified. So wouldn't it only be unethical if he was making himself more? Because the qualifications that he's saying he has, that he's indicating on the resume, he really has. So the qualifications of a counselor he has because he's a psychologist, mm -hmm. so he's going backwards. If he was a counselor saying that he had the qualifications of a psychologist, wouldn't that be unethical? What he's doing, I don't see the... There's one, there's one word that causes this to be a major issue, and that's a statement he signed. Okay. But what is it about the statement he signed that causes this to be upside down? What's the word? Complete. Is this complete? No. Can you understand and empathize with a guy for not wanting to put this stuff down, not show his true colors? Okay, let's say I hire the guy. And six months later I find out, well, you're a psychologist. You're this, you're that. If you have deceived me to come to work for me, how can I really trust you here? I've heard Lou Holtz speak a number of times. Lou is one of the greater football coaches around in history. And he has three questions he always asks an incoming football player student. And one of them, well, one of them is, do you really care about me as a person? Uh, the second is, do you really feel you've got the ability to pull this off? And third is, can I trust you? Well, this is one of the biggest problems. Does anybody here go to the University of Tennessee? God bless you, my son. I'm so glad you're not incarcerated. We're having some really problems on our hometown team, our home state team. Our football coach and our basketball coach and our, and our players, and we're just trying to put out the best team we can that are not in jail. We're having a time in Tennessee. We're going to get over it, though, aren't we? Well, what happens is these ethical questions about who you are as a person, if I can't trust you to hire you, how much can I trust you when I work? Trust only comes through vulnerability. And that's why some people quit trusting because they got hurt by somebody they were vulnerable to. Vulnerability is hard. But unless you're vulnerable, you don't have anybody who can help you in your life. And the, hurt, the worst hurt in the world is to be vulnerable to somebody and have them disappoint you, undercut you, talk about, about you badly. And then, boy, can you ever trust them again? No. And that's a hard place for you that you don't need. You don't need more hard. Trust. Resumes. You're going to be completing resumes, filling out resumes. It's really interesting to watch all the resume helpers. I got a resume from an academician, and it's 13 pages long because 11 pages are all the publications they've done. Well, if I'm really interested in that, I want to read all those publications. And I wish they'd email it separately, though. You know, so I would have 32 copies of white paper. You've got one, and I'm going to recommend to you that resume is important, but I'll tell you what's just about as important is something that goes with it called letter of interest. And you need to be very honest about what your keen interest is. Because you don't know who you're interviewing with on what kind of keen interest they have that's not even the job you're applying for. Does that make sense? All right, we're going to look at the last one we mentioned a while ago about sexting. Now, I'm always amazed at what people will put out on the Internet. I mean, I really am. I don't believe I'd have said that. 
How about read that one? Well, sexting is bad enough, but there are other things maybe that we text or we share through the waves. Uh, one of the things I've had to deal with uh, when email came out is a big deal a few years ago. I would have a person five feet from another person in the office and they would email each other back and forth for 45 minutes on lunch. You want to go to lunch with me today? Yeah, sure. Where do you want to go? Well, I don't care. What do you think? Well, what time should we go? I was thinking about, I don't know, could we go? Well, I'm thinking, maybe you ought to just both stand up and say, lunch, 11.30, where? I mean, be done with it. Email back and forth. The next thing I got into, emails are used not to send a message to somebody, but I'm going to send you an email and we'll copy everybody here. Because I really won't talk to them. I got, we got into all this confusion stuff. So I finally figured out some rules on email. One, one is you email for information purposes. And when you email anything to anybody, it's going to be around in perpetuity. Back when you had memos, you could throw them away. My son tells me that once you send an email, you can delete all you want to. And he can retrieve it. Information only. Two. If you need to work something out with somebody, get on the telephone. Third is if you have to communicate something that's emotional, especially if it's negative, only do it face to face. This captain uh, was upset with his sergeant in the army because he was just too abrupt with all of his troops. He said, you got to be a little, you got to ease into things, sergeant. You can't just come right out and poof. I said, okay. Okay, troops, everybody with a living mother, step forward. Johnson, slow down. That's pretty right in your face, a poor Johnson finding out about his mother. The other one he's got easy into it said, okay, Johnson, let me tell you, you, uh, you, you know, you got a cat at the house, and you know, the cat loves to run around the yard, and, and sometimes a cat jumps and he goes, it's a long story, and the end result is, uh, and that's how your mother died. So I'm thinking about, Sergeant, there's got to be somewhere in between. You just communicate an emotional message to somebody, and I don't have to be the too abrupt to go around the corner. Part of our problems in communicating, and I've, you've had a session on communication, part of it is, it's a transference of an understanding, so I've got to decide myself first, what is it that I understand that I want to communicate and transfer to somebody else? And then what conveyance system do I use? This sexting thing is a huge problem. Texting driving is worse. Now, and I don't want to ask you for any show of hands. But what I really like to see is somebody texting, putting on makeup, drinking coffee, and driving at the same time. And Kyle, I'm not talking about you. I don't think <laughs> you ever do that, uh, especially that makeup part. Uh, so as you look at this, what, 
What hits you about this? As an ethical question. Besides being stupid, anything? Okay, I want to close with uh, two words, stick and go. Stick and go. What I've tried to communicate with you today are about value systems, making value decisions so you don't have to make situational ethic calls. But deciding what are the value systems for you. You don't have to put it on somebody else. If Cornelius has one, you know, uh, and Peyton has another one, that's, that's, your, that's your decision. Whatever you decide is your... But then decide that's what it's going to be. And proverbial hell or high water, if that's what you're going to do. You know, had bad floods in the Midwest. A reporter from the New York Times went out to cover it. He's looking for the greatest story on the flood. He got caught by the waters, and there was a woman up on the roof of the house. She said, hey, come on up the fire escape. You can get up on my roof. So he ran up there, and he said, she said, well, I'm with the New York Times. I'm trying to look for a story in this flood. She said, well, there's a lot of stories. And about that time, this white Stetson hat comes down the water. And then it turned. And it came back against the water. And it turned. And it went this way. The guy said, I got my story. The white Stetson hat and the flood. The woman said, what's the big deal about that? That's my husband, Wilbur. He said he's going to mow the yard come hell or high water. No, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have gone. That's a, that's a Tennessee thing. Uh, here are the two words. Stick and go. Here's the stick. This is relationships. Stick with people who you discover have the same value system you have. It solves more problems than I can tell you. You really like this person, but they love to drink beer out of a long chute every night. Well, I hope you enjoy them in class. But you've got to determine if that's what you want to do, and that's your, that's how, okay, go for it. I'll be on the front row at your funeral, but stick with people who have value systems or much akin and like yours that have made some ethical pre-decisions so they don't have to make situation ethical question decisions. Go. You go where those people are doing mostly what those people are doing. Don't put yourself in a geographical situation that's going to cause you to be a major problem. I look at professional athletes. They seem to get the most press, besides some of our college athletes. Okay. Peyton, I don't want to go past that, but why do they get all this stuff? Well, I was at the nightclub. It was 3 o'clock in the morning. I didn't do anything wrong. Duh. Who are you hanging out with? Well, I'm up here in New Jersey with my friends. Who are those? Those are the same friends I have when I was in college. And this guy has got to be one of the greatest wide receivers the Titans could ever have. <laughs> and we're trying to keep the boy out of jail. He's stupid. He's highly talented. But he's still hanging out with the gang. Yeah, you with me? I mean, it's hello. Getting older doesn't make you smarter or wiser. It gives you an opportunity to make mistakes to realize that what you learned in kindergarten really works. Look both ways before crossing. Stick, and I mean stick with the people you agree with. Even though they have tough times, they have problems, you stick with them if they have the same values you have. Be a friend so you can have a friend. You trust, then they can trust you. CEOs have to trust the people first or the people can't trust the CEO. It's one of the biggest problems we have in our whole economy today. Let me stand on my soapbox just for a minute. Publicly owned businesses, CEOs, are trying to please the stockholders. True? It's their job. It's what they're hired to do. So they can comfortably sit in Pittsburgh and close a plant in North Carolina and lay off 500 people. They don't know these people. Over here is an independent business owner. They know the names of the children of their employees. Let me tell you a great rule and principle. You treat your employees 
the best, and you don't have to worry about your customers. A friend of mine wrote a book, Treat Me Like a Customer. Great book. He's a good friend. He's, 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 it's just an excellent book. Treat Me Like a Customer. And basically he's talking about relationships with each other. Do you treat your friends like they would be a best customer of your business? The stick part's important because you need to bond and help each other. Three sticks tied together are not easily broken. You try to stand on your own, it's going to be easy to break you. Stick with some folks. Find out who they are, make sure they agree with your principles, stick with them. And then go. Be sure that you're going places with people with whom you have common agreement. I think this is an example today you guys already have established some things that you think are important or you wouldn't be here. You've made a decision on how to spend your time. What caused you to make that decision? I'm not asking. But I want to congratulate you for taking the time out of your life. The only thing you can't get back. You can fail in business to come back. You can fail politically to come back. You can fail financially to come back. But you can't come back on the time you spent. I'm hoping that the time you spend here, that what you've learned, the disciplines, the opportunities, stick with you. So when you go, you will have a better format, formula, to make you more successful that will allow you to be more significant. And isn't that what we're supposed to be about? Thank you for your time, for your attention. I hope you learned. <laughs>